Forge the Narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul Murphy, your host. We have the Bell of Lost Souls podcast. This is episode 197. I got Chris Morgan and Adam Aronowitz. I believe I can fly. Who would have thought flyers would be good again? And Ricky Addington. I hate Storm Ravens. <laughs> Storm Ravens are good, man. Chris and I just did a spot with Battlehaven. You're going to hear that in the middle of the show. Uh, that's an event that Chris attended last year. This is, I believe, their second event. Uh, it is a true gaming social experience. It's not a tournament. It's not competitive play. But it is, it's It's almost a full week of vacation gaming. It's about the best that's way to the describe one, it. That's the one that's like a retreat, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. That looks awesome. Yeah. Dude, Ricky, it's great. And you guys take just wait for the middle segment. You'll hear all about it. But I, I can't, uh, I can't stop talking about how much fun I had at the last one. I'm so excited for this next one. Yeah, Sweet. you'll hear the segment, and we'll we'll touch base with them as they get a little bit further into their their planning stages, get closer to the event. We'll have them on again. I can't, I can't wait to hear them uh, talk about it. I mean, this is a, it's one of those real, real gems, real experiences that I think that you know, anyway. We we talk about it on the segment. You'll you'll hear some of our thoughts. Uh, that's going to be in the middle of the show. Of course, ATC is coming up. Never uh, heard of it. Is that uh, a big deal? I have been. Uh, <laughs> I've been working. Ricky have you? Over. Have you? Have you forgotten our last game? Is that what what it is, Ricky? <laughs> I'm blocking it out of my memory. <laughs> Don't worry, Ricky's coming in. He's been training. There was. There's going to be a. There was a Rocky montage that's been going on for the past year, and uh, I'm pretty pumped. You know, I give out live talks. Anybody, I, I got anybody who needs yeah. one, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm ha- happy to dispense them. Uh, you know, comes up every now and then, and uh, we we were close, but I think Ricky's on the right track. Yeah, I'm, TPM's uh, Panic and Life, Life Talk program. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not going to stop with the irony of a certain someone telling me to stop playing nights every year. May be playing nights this year. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, nights aren't for everybody, Ricky. I just want to let you know. <laughs> Well, you know, this is going to be one of the true litmus litmus tests for what the what the meta will develop into for Eighth Edition Forty K. But I say that almost kind of tongue in cheek because with the way the matchups work, you're not you're not bringing take all comers list. What we will see are true uh, exploitive list of the system. Which then will probably filter out into their own various archetypes, and people will will uh, will mold them into one on one tournament list. You know where you have to go through a field of players uh, individually. That's we'll see that come out of this, but uh, this I think this will help establish some of that those archetypes that we see for list building. And you know what I, I think is going to be interesting is that we're still building lists, and we have no idea what the broader meta is. You know, uh, whether you're in Atlanta where Paul is, whether you're in Tennessee or Utah or Louisiana, everybody's meta is a little bit different. We're preparing for this event as to what we think the meta will be, but we really have no idea other than what's on the Internet. The enthusiasm for the event is very high. They have 57 teams registered right now. And I know they've got a ringer team uh, in the wings ready to go, but, you know, I think they've only got a couple of, like, this is like maximum capacity slots. A couple are left open. So if you are ever considered, have ever considered coming before, or, you know, weren't able to grab a team, but you can now, there's still spots available. This is one of the premier tournament competitive events in the world. I was going to say the U.S., but it really is in the world because of the nature and the dynamic of it. Yeah, and it's it's weird because it's it's the most competitive thing I think I've ever done. I mean, I was in the band in high school. I wasn't like I played sports. So, but it was like, you know, like this is probably the most competitive thing I participate in. All the tournaments we go to and stuff, ATC is just purely a competitive event, you know, and it is still somehow one of the most fun things you're going to do in the hobby. It's it's insanely cool. It's, it's just such a different, yeah, and you're it's such a unique experience. You have yeah. to play a part for your team. Where as Adepticon, you know that that team event has grown into a, you know it's a it's a pageant, but still ultimately competitive, incredibly competitive. ATC is just more focused on the strategy of the team event, and and the and the individual games matter, but sometimes you're playing a role for your team. You've got to be a you you've got to be a defender or an attacker or you know if if those terms are maybe antiquated now with the way the scope of the event goes you have to you have to deny your opponent points sometimes just so your team crest that victory margin for the you know that in that victory threshold against your opponent i love how you talk about the differences between the two team events i mean adepticon is a pageant it, you are still competing and you're competing on so many levels there's a hobby level there's a there's a sportsmanship level but 
at the ATC, that feels so much more like you're competing on a tactical level at every stage of the game, right from when you're putting a player out and your your opposing opposing team is responding, and the interplay and the mind games that go in with that, and then the morale that comes in when you realize, all right, I'm the punching bag for our team. <laughs> I'm going to get thrown against the things that people just hate being on the receiving end of over and over again, and maintaining that attitude. And people who are good at that are the ones that are going to are going to keep advancing like Ricky. into the next rounds. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, that was my life last year. Golly. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, same here. A, I mean, little bit, a little bit more equipped at this time. Yeah, but if you know that going in, like if you know going in, hey, sometimes you're going to have to fall on a grenade. Um, and when they, when they come to you and say, hey, this is your turn, just get as many points as you can, and you do it, you know, you come out and pull a few points out of it, you still feel like you did okay because you did your job for that round. It's a neat event, and it's fun. It's it's that it's that extra level of that extra level that makes it so much more dynamic is that you are playing for the team. Yeah. And you have a very different role. It's not just a, a two day grand tournament where you can say, Oh, you know what? I botched my first game. I'm just gonna have fun and try and win my bracket. You have to play for every point and you have to play to your role on your team. And I think that's what makes it incredible. I think the the best way to explain it is any other tournament, your opponent offers you a beverage to be friendly. At ATC, they offer you a beverage hoping that it will be the one that tips you over and you start making bad decisions. <laughs> Like every time picking, I don't think I've ever won a roll to decide uh, who gets to put a list out first. I think I'm always on the worst side of that, whatever it may, it may be. Uh, but, you know, whatever. I have high hopes for the event. I think we're going to do well. But it, how neat is it they were all going into it with an equal playing Fresh. field. We're going into it with the just the indexes that GW gave us. I think it's great. I mean, we look at last year, for example, and we're... We're heavy into 7th edition. We have, I mean, any, anything that you could imagine that was a headache and a taboo list to talk about in 7th edition, it doesn't exist anymore. And we can't list design around it and team list design around it anymore. Now we're all just trying to build the best list that we can with the very limited rule sets that we have. And I think it's super fun. But I think there's a few strategies that are developing in the game right now. And the base one is is, is playing to, do you try to go first all the time? Uh, do you concede going first all the time? Um, and that's you a know big my answer topic. to this. Well, that's a big topic for debate right now because there are a lot of folks out there that don't like the way that that is currently structured. I don't have a problem with it. Um, I, I think that there's an inherent risk. Uh, even And I'm playing one of the lists that I, I'm aiming to go first 95% of the time. Unless I face four knights, I'm going to go first. But there's an inherent risk. There's a lot of armies out there that can kill what I do put on the table turn one. And that's the risk that you take. And I, I think it's the way that it's structured now, at least up until this point, I, th I still think that we need a few more months to declare if gaming the list design aspect of it is OP. Is well, that a fair way a, for me to put it? I think it? it's a strategy. I think right now with the yeah. way the rule is and the way I don't want to talk about the intent or whatever. I, I'm only talking about what is, uh, is, is printed. I think that it is a strategy and that's part of how you will approach the game and design your list. And I, and I think on the other side that if you, if you've got over eight drops, eight, nine drops, then you probably just need to plan on going second. Right. 100%. And, and then if you're going that direction, you know, maybe just see what you can fit in the brigade. Go for the command points. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the real <laughs> answer is. And I don't know every army that can do that effectively. Guard. Yep. Looking at Guard. you. Yeah. I, I do uh, think yeah, that um, there's there's definitely some, some layers that go into that decision making. I think the biggest influencer, honestly, on making that choice is how good is the terrain? Because if the terrain is good enough, blocks enough line of sight to keep your your model safe from a hard hitting low model count army, you can confidently plan on going second. However, if the terrain is sparse, if it's you know like uh, small areas of grass that yes you're getting the plus one cover, but you're exposed and you're targetable, then I think it's go first or bust. You know, it could be, and I think that we're going to see things develop around that. And I believe that the the race to pack in as many units in the least amount of drops, it, while it is a strategy, it's also a bit of a fad. Yeah, I mean, we've played we've played this 
style with Age of Sigmar since the game has been out, and it's accepted. No one really complains about that that sort of thing in Age of Sigmar. So I think it's I think it's just accepting the new the new format. Uh, you know, after after it being a certain way for so many years and going into this, I think it's just that fear of change or that you know just that hesitance to go that route. So I think once people get used to it, uh, that you know, it'll settle down. But at the same time, you know, when we go to Sigmar tournaments, we say, you know, hey, how many drops do you have when, we, when we're when we setting up? Because we want to know that. But, you know, you plan for it. You plan your list for it. You plan your, your deployment strategy for it. And I think that's something that will just become part of the game and people will just, you know, drive on once they get used to it. I'm playing one of the, the low drop lists. It's five drops total. And I don't think that's extremely low. I, I've seen three drop and four drop lists. Ricky, the night player, I'm sure has played some four drop lists. What are yep. some other low drop lists out there? Land Raider? Well, I'll go. Is that? I'll let me just trump all the discussion on this. Okay. Um, Macro Cannon Aquila Strongpoint holding 30 models. <laughs> <laughs> right. that's, one, that's one way to do it. <laughs> well, you, so, you know, I know ATC, this isn't going to matter as much, but if you want the more mobile version of that, you could always go for the Mastodon. <laughs> right, we can't do that at ATC. Well, like a Fortress of Redemption, you know, which holds a bunch of models too. There, there are ways to cram in a bunch of single model choices based based on the uh, the way that attachments work. You know, there are there are a bunch of single model elite choices that you can point up. You can put all you put all kind of points on them uh, and stick them in one of these things, and you've got you know two drops. What are assassins? You could take a, a, a shed load of assassins and put them all over a Fortress of Redemption or a, or a readout and, or whatever. And then you've got a single drop army uh, with 2,000 points. And what I'm getting at is what it, against the list that you're going to see on the other side of the table. And what I'm seeing is a lot of MSU guard with mortars or las cannon heavy weapons teams or uh, mana cores obviously are a big one. Am I afraid of going against a fortress with a bunch of dudes inside, four Storm Ravens or three Land Raiders? No, I'm not, even if they have first turn. Yeah, I'm not I, saying that these things are good. I think that the whole strategy around it, uh, or I shouldn't say it's, I think things in the game are pretty balanced. You know, so if you've got uh, 2,000 points worth of 2,000 points, if you've made intelligent choices, I think we're in a state in the game right now where you're going to have a fun game. You're going to have a game out of it. I think the desire uh, to build towards that, the the leanest drop amount, is uh, something that we're all doing because we never had the opportunity to do that before. And then one, as the game matures, it will matter less. Well, coming from previously being the most seized upon player in 40k, I'm stoked to build a list that can one in six chance almost guarantee me uh, first turn every time. I'm <laughs> I'm all about it. No, I get it, but that's where I'm going. Is that we didn't have the opportunity to play to this before, and now we do, so it's exciting. Um, and and yep. it is, I mean, it is something we consider. I mean, we, you know, we talked about drops on this from the the first time that we uh, were were exposed to it as well. It is something to consider, and with things like Storm Ravens, which I'm still going to consider as a Blood Angel specific uh, piece of equipment, uh, is I mean, it's it's a very powerful thing with everything having split fire, you know. Having three Bane Blades or whatever on the table, that's not a bad idea anymore. Nope, nope. In fact, that's uh, that's a that's almost as ubiquitous now as the uh, as the Storm Raven uh, redundancy. Let's call it that. Uh, <laughs> in in terms of hey, look, here's three really powerful fire bases that can shoot at whatever they feel like, and they're surrounded by bodies, real cheap, expendable bodies. And, and all, and you're only doing that to prevent some type of a uh, first turn charge shenanigans, you know. And, and that's what I love. I like had a couple of games just go the a- absolutely pear shaped because they were able to get their their swoop in charge or burrow up charge on me. And it's like, well, there's that flank gone. What am I going to do with another with my thousand points against their two thousand now? You got you got to try to make it a game. I'm actually pretty happy that Tyranids are so capable of getting in there early in the game now because it. I think it's about the only thing that's forcing a lot of players to put troops in their list because all these Razorback spam lists I've seen, the, uh, you know, all mechanized lists, um, when you don't have that chaff in front of them, they become a, a big liability real quick. So, but without Tyranids or something charging into their face, they're, 
they'll just run amok. So I'm pretty happy that. I think it's pretty exciting, dude, that all the talk about the increase in points of vehicles and things like Razorbacks are still are one of the top lists well, right now, if you ask me. But Razorbacks, yeah, I think Razorbacks are still extremely point efficient. They're only 100 points getted out with twin assault cannons. That's so what that's I'm going to say. Yep, I agree. Not with too far cry from where they were before. That is an in comparison infinite, to infinitely more expensive than they were three months ago. You think yeah, so? Well, I was what, paying six what? months ago, seventy-five was, or eighty-five points. Were no, I was paying twenty points. Yeah, <laughs> I was paying twenty. Points well, okay. Forget about. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Forget about the the. Yeah, I'm not talking about Gladius right That's now, but yeah, you're absolutely though, right. Because yeah. of the the, the weird yeah. transition between from free to a hundred points, and then the the. I'm going to use backlash, but like a soft backlash, some uh, some mumbles, some stirrings out there about people thinking that vehicles were going to be good. And the humble rhino even, you know, has still has a place. You know, I know that there's been a talk about drop pods and how they aren't as good anymore. And I, and I, I, I don't think that they are. I, I don't want, I'm not, I don't want to blow smoke towards the drop pod. You don't want to advocate that. Yeah. It's, it's not as good as it was, but I still see them in people's list. I, I mean, I agree just because of the, the wall of Razorbacks with Gilliman standing behind them Tell them how good of a how good of a job they are doing. You're doing a great job, Rich. Motiv- You're doing a great job. Hey, you know what? Take another shot here. Uh, you know you missed. Here's some here's some more bullets. Reroll that. You just go to work. I, that's one thing that kind of bothers me about that list is that like in my mind, Gilliman should just be charging in and just wrecking people. And instead he's he's sitting behind a wall. He's reserved to a, a counter assault he's unit. A leader. Just, you know, he he knows come he knows touch my guys to hang out behind the razorback. <laughs> see see Ricky, think- Gilliman only acts that aggressive after he's been pushed out in airlock. <laughs> Before, before that, before that point, he's he's very much content to administrate. Uh, I, I don't I don't want our listeners like, to think like I'm, I'm talking crap about the Razorbacks. I really love it, and I actually really love. I've called it the, the Robo Cop list, and other people have called it you know other funny names. But I, I really like the Razorback Circus surrounding Gilliman and some Tech Marines. I think it's a really fun list. The point I'm making for the whole thing here is that because of the increase in points for most vehicles, folks were instantly ready to write them off. But they're still very much a part of this game, and that's where you know where we're at right now. Things are still developing. We don't know what the best is yet. Uh, but going back to the ATC is that I think that will start to really develop after this tournament coming up uh, here in a couple of weeks. And I want to agree with what you're saying and even maybe take it a step further. I think vehicles, we're, we are seeing more vehicles on the list today than we did in 7th edition. Definitely more dreadnoughts, that's for sure. Well, we're, we're definitely seeing people pay for more vehicles than they did in 7th edition. <laughs> yeah, outside of oh, that, Yeah, so that. You keep, you that's the best way to say it. Gladius existed. <laughs> and, uh, but that's I'm talking about point. over overarching many different armies we're seeing we're seeing more vehicles i'm not just talking about space marines here but yeah yeah i i I hear you loud and clear people are willing to pay the points for a rhino now that i mean i think chris said it best we're we're seeing more people pay for the vehicles than we ever have i mean i'm gonna be honest in in seventh edition i'm i may be sold i mean i'm a small shop but i may be sold one dreadnought and eight because you know everybody just had the few they had from starter sets and whatever and nobody used them and gosh just what two days ago i sold three i think to the same guy so uh <laughs> were they available did, uh, did he order some auto cannons from forge world uh, the auto cannons may be on the way maybe <laughs> <laughs> they're so good man i mean 10 11 vindreds you're not you're not gonna go wrong look that that list may not be great six months from now but it's awesome right now right right now it's yeah a- it's a great list <laughs> the uh, the ETA guys came down, uh, East Tennessee Adepticus uh, from Knoxville. They came down uh, the other day to the shop and, and brought their um, ATC lists to, to practice. And they whipped out the obviously Gilman Razorback spam. And that one, that one gutted me. And then um, we, <laughs> They're, then they decided to like pull the you know the gloves off and put the what was it five storm ravens with uh with the uh, Drago in there teleport Drago up to the middle of the field and then you know every gray knight storm raven is just re rolling everything and just cleaned our clock it was, that sounds good it was super good it was <laughs> we did we kind of stood back afterwards we're like. Is this what the game has become? <laughs> it's like, what do I do? Look, when I, when that, I hear well, that, Drago, that's something that's we've we've got to we've got to think about now. And yeah, and flyers a, have just 
have have really gone through the roof in terms of their effectiveness. And all of us that had a ton of flyers beforehand, I mean, we get the stink eye from people. But you know, like Paul was saying, it oh, is Chris, the original you and I have blood been chomping our, well, Yeah, but I mean, we've like, been chomping our bits for this. Well, what was funny was uh, the guy playing that just happened to buy these Storm Ravens off of somebody uh, just a few months ago, and then eighth edition drops, and he's like, "Oh my gosh!" <laughs> so, I got the Storm Ravens. But look, you tell me a story about Drago doing Drago stuff, and uh, you know, I just smile. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, granted, I I was playing my buddy, and he had Drago, and I killed him in Overwatch with a flamer. But other than that, yeah, Drago is really good. <laughs> Drago's not going to retell that story. He's not. I mean, he's he's, no, he's motivating no, those ravens like fly harder, guys. <laughs> like, yeah, gray knights are fun. Uh, I've we've been having a blast just watching them. You know, gate of infinity all over the table, throw out their little mini smites everywhere. They they've been a fun list to play, and they're they can be competitive now. So which is. Which is exciting that I, I'm seeing people excited to play Grey Knights. Which We had a yeah. guy reach out to the show not that long ago, and he asked, what should I do, Nids or Grey Knights? And I said, Nids immediately, because the Exocrine is like the best. Oh, that's money. That yeah. is money. Yeah. The Exocrine is like, it's when they're rolling dice, it's almost like, I feel like something's wrong right now. There's something going bad. It's a, bro- it's a broadside. I mean, it's it's like a ter- it's a f- complete feel bad experience on the other side of it, and I'm also kidding about that because it's not. I mean, it has to stand still, you get to shoot twice, but when it does shoot and when it does hit, uh, it does if tons of wounds. Feels like you're cheating. It does. It feels two like damage each. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's rough. Uh, but he's like, well, a bunch of people. Just, he's like, I know like six people that just picked them nids. I'm like, well, you're not gonna wrong, gonna go wrong with gray knights because I think they're not getting. I think the gray knights are still a little bit under the radar. Yeah. Uh, but they well, do have, I mean, they've got force weapons. They have good shooting. Uh, they've got the, the Raven potential we just talked about. Uh, oh. They've got their own psychic dread knights. They've got you also everything have, Space Marines have right now. So, I mean, you know, with a few Knights. little exceptions. Yeah. Plus Dread Knights. I mean, it's everybody's, everybody's hot on dreadnoughts. Guess what? Grey Knights have dreadnoughts. Guess what? Grey Knights can smite with their dreadnoughts. It's not amazing smite, but they can do it. That's just one extra little thing they get. Uh, everybody likes Razorbacks. Guess what? Grey Knights have Razorbacks. Grey Knights are so, now just as strong as any other Marine chapter out there, gr- if not Grey Knights, g- Grey Knights do Razorbacks better than any other Astartes army in the meta today, and here's why. Take a Vanguard force. I believe it's a Vanguard force because Acolytes are elite choices now, and you only need to take one, correct? But for that one acolyte, you get a dedicated transport. It doesn't take even matter back. because you take, take a, you take, take a, a dreadnought back. and you get a dedicated transport. Oh, take a ra- but, but I'm talking about <laughs> if you want to max out on Razorbacks, you don't take a dreadnought. You take right. an acolyte inside of a Razorback. And now you're fielding 15 Razorbacks in a 2,000-point list. Hey, are we going to touch on the fact that the GW FAQ brought out brought up the uh, understrength units and said that you only pay the points for the model you have? <laughs> which that is that, something there, no there's no way that's going in a tournament right yeah, most <laughs> tournaments are, are are fine to adopt the gw fact or fact except, uh, except for that, that's it. <laughs> and that and that's what the atc is doing too now i get where they're going i get where they're coming from let me take it back a step further is that you know what we've kind of heralded as a superlative for this edition is that they support all methods of play the the matched play the open play and the narrative play and that is a big, uh, I guess, like component of the non-match play styles. And, you know, I, so I get where they're going. They want you to play with the models that you had. And they want to make it possible for you to play with all the models that you have. So it's fine for them to support that. But we, we it's us on the tournament side. They make things awkward sometimes. No, never us. In a good way. Now, look, we, we, all, we just want to be – all we want to do is be competing on the same scale with the same rules. That's it. So, right. But that also leads to some <laughs> – we want the rules and things to function a certain way. That doesn't mean the game is built just for us. Yeah, I agree with that. So, But we're still not doing that in tournaments. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no way. That's all I'm saying. Um but it is it is kind of neat they pointed out. I I think that that's um I don't know. Again, I get where they're going, but it's not it's not how I would do it. Yeah, for I mean for you know for John and Nancy who were picking up their very first game and their their allowance hasn't come in, so they could pick up that extra box. You know, it it makes sense that 
you know, they're they're going to play with the models they have and pay the points. They want to play points instead of power level, so they're going to pay the point. You know, it it makes sense. It's a good thing for for a GW to to put in there. Um, it's also a good thing for us as tournament players to just you know pretend doesn't exist well, and just move on. Think of the situation that has to occur for you to have an understrength unit because they don't sell understrength units. You'd have to lose a figure, pick up a squad secondhand. Uh, how, well, they do. It, I mean, up, how does it they do work? right now? There, there's some tyrannid units that you could take one to three or one to whatever the number was, and they only sold them in one offs. And I, I think that that's a big reason why that they allowed it, because there's a lot of Tyranid players out there that said, well, now I need to have three of them to play a game, and I have to go buy more. So they said, well, you can, you just pay for that one model. I don't, I don't, know, which, I don't know what that unit is. I don't think that thing exists. I, just don't, it, I don't think that that situation is for a single Tyranid unit. But I just think no, that, I, I think that the uh, how it even occurs that you might not have a full string squad is not the norm. Is where I'm going. Right. But whatever. I still think it's cool that they you know have rules and some kind of structure for however anybody wants to play. That's you know cool. what else is not the norm, Paul? People are playing like mass razor wing flock. In eighth edition, that's not normal. Nothing people, about this edition is normal. People, that well, that was normal for a period of time. Oh, it was that was very normal. Way in, w- uh, the maybe towards the end of sixth, may, maybe into fifth. I can't remember the time period, but that was actually normal for a while. Uh, but we chase efficiency, and the razor wing flock a, as tournament players, as competitive pl- players, and the razor wing flock is incredibly efficient. Can somebody pull up what the points and the stats on that is? Uh, yeah, give me just a second. But because you can get them en masse and still take some beef character to stick in the in the middle of, or, you know, kind of as a as something to buff them, you know, it's it's a strategy. It's valid. And now, you know, things wound everything. So a lot of attacks is a lot of attacks that could end up doing something. All right. So I found the razor wing flock. It's one to twelve models per unit at seven points per model. What's the wounds and the toughness and whatnot and the attacks? Four wounds, eight attacks, two strength, two toughness. 12 inch move. Did you say eight attacks? Yeah. Yeah. What? So the Razor Ring Flock has a movement of 12, has a five plus weapon skill, it's strength two, right? Uh, but yeah. it has four wounds with eight attacks. Uh, think about what that would do to like a gun line of conscripts. <laughs> well, it, well I, I think that I think that was what was in people's minds when they said, "Hey, I'm going to put 75 of these in a list." All right. Well, it's not it's not infantry, so you know it couldn't claim the relic. Uh, but it's incredible. What was the points on this, Ricky? Uh, seven points per model. Yeah. Not including war gear, and war gear is what claws and talons. No, you know, remember, even though it's got four wounds, if you if you lose morale, uh, then you know you're picking up whole models, but you can still get a ton of these guys. Four next to no points. Claws and talons are free, just FYI. So seven points. It seems like it. Seems like it would be free. It should be, yeah. Dark. <laughs> Problem is, as you pointed out, though, their leadership is four. So as soon as they take a uh, <laughs> a morale test, they're gone. Well, with four wounds, they do also have a seven plus save. So it's going to be real hard. So that's why you got <laughs> you know, to take things to to help these guys. Uh, but that's that's why you're going to see these is because they have so many attacks, so cheap. Um, and they do. They kill conscripts, I would imagine, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, they hit on a five plus, but they can move 12 and they fly. So they could even engage flyers, fly, flyers with the uh, specific airborne rule. Yeah. And I mean... They're strength two. So, I mean, you're hitting on fives and sixes. Or, I'm sorry, you're hitting on fives, wounding on five or six. So, it doesn't really matter if you throw them against conscripts or throw them against a, a jet, you know, a, a storm raven. Because either way, you're you're pretty much wounded on about the same thing anyway. So, why not? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hate to see a Magnus get beat down by a bunch of razor wings, but I could see it happening. Speaking of stories that somebody's not going to tell, would, that would be one of them. I would actually love to see that happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I have to imagine, and I apologize for not combing through this a little bit better, but I have to imagine that there are going to be uh, some things that do buff those. Uh, you know, there's all kind of things like plus ones and reroll ones and stuff all, all throughout this. And they do get, I mean, I think that they get the power from pain, right? The com- the uh, all Drukari units with this ability. Then maybe they don't uh, have power from pain. I don't see power from pain on there. I'm trying to see if I gotta find the power. Hold on one second. Let me go read power for pain. All Drakari units with this ability gain a bonus depending upon which battle route it is, yada yada yada. So it should actually say power from pain, right? Yeah, power from pain. They do not have power from pain. 
Gotcha. Who does have power from pain? Uh, let's see here. Rax, Beastmaster, uh, Grotesques do, obviously. Incuba. It seems like the majority, the majority of the units have it. Uh, looks like vehicles do not get it. Well, the razor wing slugs don't. <laughs> <laughs> it makes. I mean, it makes sense that they're you know the Void Raven isn't juicing up <laughs> or fueled by the uh, the warp release of yeah. or whatever. Well, cool. All right, well, let's take a quick break. Uh, then we're gonna come in for with the Battle Haven spot that Chris Morgan and I did, and then we'll come back and do the back half of the show. Can't Sounds wait. Good. FTN is brought to you by Bell of Lost Souls. Check out www.bols.org for the best daily hobby articles on the web. Hey everybody, welcome to a very special segment of Forge the Narrative. I'm Paul Murphy. I got Chris Morgan here. Hey guys. And Chris, we're joined by Sarah Hollingshead from Battlehaven. Hello. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. We talked about it last year. Uh, this is an event unlike any other that I've heard of. This is almost like a gaming paradise. I have to agree with you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not too far off the mark. And Chris, you went last year. <laughs> I did. I, I was I was very fortunate to be invited out there, and I had a blast. You know, I I would have said myself, you know, the the Garden of Eden of gaming, uh, <laughs> just because of the the whole experience, the aesthetic, and and how perfectly it catered to what I'm interested in, which is rolling dice on cool tables with delicious food and excellent people so well thanks chris that's awesome it, it's no, in, I, I love the event this takes place on september 26th which is not a weekend and goes through the 30th which is a weekend this is tuesdays through, through saturday in september that's correct. Yeah, it runs the whole um, the whole week, most of the week anyway. And, and before people get like, what is this, uh, you know, a tournament or some type of gaming convention that's in the middle of the week? Well, it's it's more than that. Uh, this is actually a, a almost like a vacation destination where they uh, centered around gaming and the social experience. It is. We think of it as uh, kind of like a cruise on land for gamers. It really is <laughs> an all-inclusive retreat. Uh, can can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, because all inclusive, you can actually go to the site. It's battlehaven.us. That's right. And you can you can, you can also see find us on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, so so the, you can see the dates there, uh, and you can also get uh, an idea of the landscape and the scenery. You, you guys that have been listening for a while may have heard us talk about this um, last year, but the pictures and our words don't do the absolute breathtaking view justice. I mean, this this takes place on a twenty acre resort. It does. It's a private private property. It's beautiful. It's set uh, up against the mountains in Utah. It's back by Park City. I think a lot of people know Park City because of Sundance Film Festival. It's in a town called Heber, right near there, and uh, it's just it's just gorgeous. One of the prettiest places on the planet, and uh, you just get to be nestled right down in the middle of it all. And the property is gorgeous. It has um, has a private lake on the property. There's lots of amenities on site. It's just 24 seven. Well, 24 five. Great time. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned the amenities. This is all this stuff is open and available because you guys have the whole, whole facility. We do. We have the entire facility. There aren't any neighbors or anything right around. It's just us. Um, so it really is set in a beautiful, pristine kind of pastoral area of Utah. And, uh, and so we can just do everything that we want to do there. It's just been really exciting to find this location and be able to use it this year. We're really excited about it. We were there last year, and this will be our second time in that location. And I know that we we talked a little bit, you know, a lot about it already, but the landscape and just how pretty it looks and and the amenities. But this is focused around gaming. This this takes place on the resort. You know, we mentioned how big it is, and I think there are are different um, room types that people can select. Uh, on the website, there, is it? Yeah, there are. We have different packages. I mean, our main goal is to make this very accessible for everyone. And so we have a lot of different options from a reserves pass, which is just coming gaming all day long and having your own accommodations that fits many people's needs um, up to, you know, just private rooms. So there's a lot of different options. And most of the time, uh, pretty much all the time, we can have it fit anyone's budget. We have great payment plans. We just do a lot to just make sure it happens. I mean, we're in this for the fun. And that, that information is on the website for people can see and the different packages and the prices. And you mentioned it's a cruise on land, and that's not too far off the mark. I mean, for an all-inclusive five-day vacation in a luxury place, you know, I, 
the prices are what they are, but they're pretty good. I think that they are. We've really worked very hard to keep it affordable and, like I said, accessible. So uh, we're very excited about it. And it's, it's proven to be a great concept that people are excited about as well. So we've enjoyed all the great people that have come out and we have people returning. And uh, it's just been a lot of fun. I think the, the actual goal centered around the engagement and the social aspect, because this is not, I mentioned it's not like any other tournament because it's not a tournament. There, there's a, you don't have a, a, a structured game that lasts the whole day. You have, you have a series of gaming tables that are suitable for all types of miniature war games and, and board games too, I would have to imagine. Oh, yeah, I mean, even just, uh, if, sorry, Sarah, just, just no, to kind of cut in with my experience from last year. Uh, you know, I, I played a game that was on a trench table, and then I played a game that was set up uh, Zone Mortalis style inside of like a ship interior, and then I played uh, another game that was on more of a foresty backdrop. Uh, then there were the Wild West Exodus demos that was uh, it was done on kind of a, a, a Western steampunkish sort of sort of theme. Uh, and then, of course, there were the board game tables downstairs, and there was there were places where people were setting up uh, to hobby and to to paint. And it was basically like it, it, if there is space there for you to do something, whatever it is you want to do, you can go do it. Like That's that. right. We uh, we really try to cater specifically to what our guests are interested in. So part of our planning is to send out a questionnaire to each of the guests that are coming and find out what they want to play. You know, what not just what they have played or what they're good at, but the things they haven't played yet. And then we provide people to do that as much as we can, as much as we possibly can. And we've always been able to. So it's uh, it's exciting to have that and to have a lot of we have a lot of house armies that we bring as well. So that if you haven't played a particular game, but you want to, we do our best to provide everything that you need to learn as well. And, and it's friendly. And this is not just around 40K and Age of Sigmar. This, this is representative of many different types of games. It is, though I would say that 40K is our core. Um, we do have a lot of different games just to keep it mixed up or for different people's interests. So we've had a lot of people that that are really maybe a little less into 40K, but still really want to have this great experience and will come out and play, you know, Infinity and Malifaux or um, just anything, really, anything that they that they're into. We had a lot of people playing X-Wing. It's just it just really depends on what you want to do. And then there were several uh, that Shannon and I hung out with playing uh, board games almost the whole time and card games and, you know, other really fun things. I love board games. I mean, I, I have a huge collection myself uh, and I find that I don't always get the opportunity to play them. You know, I don't know a lot of hardcore competitive gamers th that aren't 40K gamers. So if I want to play a really hardcore competitive board game or maybe in something that's just involved, in an involved uh -huh. board game, you don't always have the audience and, the, and your group of friends, but I feel like you could run into those kind of people at, at something like this. I, I agree with you. I feel like you really do. There's so many of us. We find that uh, every time we set up a fun game, like last year we played Game of Thrones for I don't know how many hours, but it was so much fun. And these are some of the same people that were playing 40K, but uh, then some others that do other, that enjoy other things. And we all just came together and had a blast doing that. Or Zombicide, we played that as well. It just there's, It's just so much fun. We just do a lot of whatever we're interested in. It's a good time to be away from everything else and really concentrate on the fun. And you guys have some industry people coming as well, right? We do. We have some really great guests coming. These are all, or they're becoming, they're coming up on the website. Several of them are there. We have more to add, but we we definitely have Chris Morgan coming out again this year. We're super excited about that. Yay, Chris. Yeah, almost as excited as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're excited to have you guys there. And then um, we've got Dave Lewis from Drop Zone. He does Drop Zone Commander and Drop Fleet. He's a Hawk War Games owner coming out from uh, England, actually. He's flying over the pond. So we're excited to have him there. We have yeah, that's, that's a pond. That's some land. That's a few lakes. That's a lot of fields he's flying over. <laughs> yeah, quite a few at a continent. And uh, totally <laughs> excited to have him come. We have Lynn Stahl. He's a painter. Uh, she's from Metalhead Minis. She's coming out. Nestor, who does Infinity Tournaments, he's coming out. We have uh, other people that are local and around the area that are, are well-known in the industry and in the community who will be there. So they'll be great opponents and uh, just, just come and meet new friends. I mean, it's pretty exciting. That's awesome. Now, can we talk about the food? Yes, we can definitely, definitely talk about the food. That's one of my favorite things. As, as much as I like rolling dice, uh, I also love to eat. Yeah, Food's 
food's really important. And you guys have, I mean, the, we mentioned it's all inclusive and that does include the, the meals and, and whatnot. And you guys have themed dinners planned. You had that last year. I know, I know Chris spoke very highly of it. <laughs> we just thought that would be such a fun addition and not something we've seen done before. So we actually, um, we actually decided to, to add that on and we're expanding that this year. So we have all of the dinners are, we'll have a theme uh, on a, on a gaming system or army and uh, there's, there's custom terrain built for them as well as additional things we're adding on and it will go around the type of meal. And so, yeah, we just, we just feed you till you can't eat any more and then we offer more. So uh, it's all breakfast, lunch and dinner and snacks and beverages and just everything. Uh, yeah. Everything. And, and this is better food than just like driving driving over to Applebee's. Like this is <laughs> this is catered quality food put it on is. like like last year. I think my favorite thematic one was the Tao sushi, uh, where I mean it was all it was all set up and they had prepared like frisbees that looked like Tao towers to put to lay out the sushi on, and it was this whole thing. And I just uh, I, I was laughing while I was eating. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's easy for us to to like kind of gloss over the description here, but this is a, a pretty immersive, a, a very immersive event, uh, and it goes even in all the details like what you're mentioning. I don't even think we can describe the awesomeness of it. I think you want to go to the website and check the pictures. Yeah, and even those don't do it justice, but they are a good place to start. It's so much fun, and we've got some new things, some new themes, uh, new meals, different menu this year. So. I just, you know, so we can do some more things, some things that are different. So we're really excited about that as well. Yeah, I, I don't want it to also get lost. This is in a resort. I mean, we're saying that that the, you're there in a very, one of the prettiest places in, in the U.S. Uh, being really able is. to play what, you know, whatever game you like, there's space and people, you know, people there that are interested in the same things that you are. It's a, a really good place for like-minded people to come and take a break. I mean, this is in, I mean, what's, what's the, uh, the temperature there that time of year? Oh, it's just, it's cooled off after the summer, which is fantastic because it gets pretty warm here in Utah in, uh, in the summertime. And so we're just going into, into uh, the fall, into September, and it's cool in the evenings. It warms up during the days. Uh, it's just, it's gorgeous. A heated pool, so you can use that at any time. Hot tub. We've had some roaring games of uh, basketball. We won't go into that uh, in the pool. <laughs> We've had some really, just some really I, good I have some there. very distinct memories of things that happen in that pool. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really, it was a really good time. We have uh, outdoor fire pits. Uh, we we sit out and visit and laugh and listen to music. And I mean, it's just, it just has everything. It just has everything for everybody. And we we really, we really enjoy this, uh, the camaraderie that we build there. It is, it's a special thing. I mean, you don't get this event everywhere. Uh, well, you don't get it anywhere except where you want. You really right don't. Now. I mean, that's you really don't get this. I mean, there's there's other things out there, um, but uh, we've just taken this to the next level or maybe two or three levels up. It's really the best that there is. I mean, there really aren't enough events that focus more on the social side of things. And that's really what I mean, when you're spending this amount of time, hours with an individual or a group of individuals, you know, supposed to be having fun. You know, we don't get that everywhere. And it's really nice that you guys have, have focused in on that. Yeah, we love that. And it's great to be staying there. You know, you're, you've are you got a, a r- private room or a shared room or whatever you're staying in for your accommodations and able to just take a break. If you want to take a nap in the middle of the day to kind of like sleep off lunch <laughs> or whatever, you have the chance of just, you know, just taking a break, doing whatever you want, going down to the theater room and watching a movie, you know, playing ping pong or pool if you want to. So there's there's a lot of options and it's great to feel like it's just really wraps up the whole entire week. And if your yeah. significant other is not into the, the gaming as much as you are, there are things for them to do. There are. In fact, we have quite a few significant others coming this year. We had some last year as well. And this year, some repeat. In fact, one of the wives said, this is what we're doing next year for our anniversary. <laughs> she demanded it. So she bought a ticket before her husband even had a chance to, uh, I'm sure he wanted to come back too, but it was really great that she was so enthusiastic. That is awesome. And you guys are butting up against another big event in the area that people might have, have all already heard about. Yeah, they may have because it's really made a lot of news. Uh, the Salt Lake Comic Con is taking place just the week, uh, the weekend before, the weekend prior. So I believe that the Salt Lake Comic Con, it grew very, very fast. I think it's the second largest of its kind in the nation. So it's really quite a huge event and a lot of fun. They have really amazing 
artists and uh, people coming out, great actors and uh, performers. And uh, so they've got a great lineup that's worth checking out as well. And that's happening just the weekend before Thursday, Friday and Saturday. I'm sorry, Thursday. Yeah, I think it's Thursday, Friday and Saturday. I got that right. Yeah, I I believe it's like the the Thursday night and then Friday and Saturday. And people may not realize this, but uh, Utah has the highest per capita geek population in the United States. (laughs) So that Comic-Con reflects that quite a bit. When the fire department it's... keeps like showing up to, to oh, there's too many people in here. Oh, Get where it's going is that the people, if they're already going to that, they may be able to just extend their trip and come on over to you guys. Yeah, or vice versa. If you're coming out for us, you might, you know, decide to come a little bit earlier and uh, check out Comic Con. That's pretty neat. Uh, is there anything that, that is there anything we haven't covered uh, about the event? I mean, what it, let's go down the, the list of superlatives in a luxury resort in a beautiful place. Uh, I don't want the food to go unmentioned. <laughs> uh, gaming <laughs> for days, literal days. That's right, and uh, of course classes. Uh, we have lots of instruction. We have great people coming out. Awesome camaraderie. Game demos. Game demos. Painting demos. Yeah, and uh, we give away some really fun prizes, so we have That's some right. awesome great support as well. Yeah, there were some games that were given out last year, uh, some uh, miniature carrying cases, things like that. Uh, just re- really cool stuff. Yeah, that part's really fun. Sarah, it was, it's great talking with you. And they can find you at battlehaven.us. Is that, is that correct? Battlehaven, yeah, battlehaven.us. You can also check us out. We have some videos up on YouTube, and we've got um, you know things that are happening being added all the time on Facebook. We're a new company, but uh, the pictures, images, and information is growing all the time on those channels. That's awesome. Well, I, I want to talk to you again uh, before the event to see how things are going, if that's okay. That'd be fantastic. We'd love to. Awesome. I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sarah. Great talking to you. Take care. Bye-bye. Forged Forged Narrative is brought to you by DiceHead.com. www.DiceHead.com. Games, hub, supplies, and comics. They have it all. Hey, everybody. We are back. I'm still Paul Murphy. I got Ricky Addington. Oh, hey. That's me. We picked up Andrew Whitaker. What up, homies? Adam O'Brien Winston, Chris Morgan. Did you guys know that conscripts are life? I've heard they're the best unit in 40K. What do you think, Andrew? You heard it here first. Conscripts are absolute garbage. Oh, the horror. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, today we got an announcement from GW about they're going to be putting out 10 codexes this year. For the, over the remainder of the year, 10 codexes will, will be released. I'm not going to lie. I read that entire article one-handed while driving down the interstate. Not the safest thing, but I had to read it. <laughs> I mean, what is that, two a month or so? As as your attorney, I don't want you to repeat that on a public podcast. That's I, sorry, officer. I read that while my wife drove me to work. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's it's two a month, uh, and it's an it, like it's pretty exciting. I mean, I yeah, you know, I've heard some people on the internet express some frustration about the whole like, hey, we're doing it with codices. It's all going to be indexes now, and then the indexes are going to be phased out. We're going to back I mean, go back. To I don't know who thought that. I mean, who, who yeah, they, legitimately they, thought that? They always said that that the codices were going to be coming back. They, they that was never a front. Yeah, they we knew said, that from day one. I just what I want to understand is like how Chris is going to be able to deal with this. You know, being the librarian, having to read everything. Like, is your budget going to be okay? Are you going to be able to read this much? I have some real concerns because they're actually moving forward the story for these factions. So there isn't stuff that I haven't read before. And uh, it is it is a little bit uh, I, I may have to make, sell, make an appeal to sell some bodily fluids, some authoritative figure, Gilliman, like petition him. Hey, you know, life is the emperor's cu- currency. If I give you some of mine, will you give me these books? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we know we're going to get the stratagems for specific uh, factions now. You know, I'm sure we'll have some cool war gear relics and stuff. will make a return. Uh, some some of the flavor that is now missing from this. Now, and then we know we're getting Marines first. That's no that's no secret. That was what was uh, splashed up today. And they gave us an idea of what's coming afterwards. And it was really cool to see that we're going to, like, Death Guard are high on the list. I know Power Armor or whatever. Bear with me. The fact that we're getting a Legion-specific codex is something we've wanted for, I don't know, generations of gamers at this point. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a mathematical theory, and it is the, uh, the 
relationship between the number of power armor owners versus non-power armor o- owners is the inverse of the actual presence of power armor in the 40k universe to those without it. So <laughs> in that sense, it makes sense that the power armor codexes would get the attention first because, well, they're they're going to sell them to more people because more people have Marines. There's no doubt that, like, Marines are going to be, or ha- have been and always will be the most powerful. I, you know, I've, I remember a short time guest on this podcast, good friend of the show, Kelly Wallace, has always said he's always consistently surprised when Space Marines have good gameplay rules because GW is going to sell those models no matter what, right? They're the poster boys. They're so mm-hmm. cool looking and they're so awesome. He's like, From you don't need a point of view business yeah, wise. You don't need to make their rules good for people to buy those models. Uh, right. Conversely, you know, it's a little tougher to sell Tau models when they're terrible. And that, you know, so all that to say, Space Marines getting the first codex, that makes perfect sense. It's wonderful. It's great. Everyone's going to have it. We're all going to buy it. We're all going to talk about it. I think the most exciting thing about today's announcement, Paul, if you'll forgive the segue, is that there was a very clear, strong, almost unequivocal announcement that regiments, lesser dynasties, um, smaller casts of Tau, everyone's going to have their kind of own subset of rules. So the the quote-unquote old-school chapter tactics – um, are going to be proliferated across all the codices. Uh, and that's the most exciting thing to me. Yeah. It's going to be Catechins are going to have different rules than Vestroyans that are going to be different from Death Corps, that are going to be different from Mordians. And that's really, really cool. I think so, too. This I mean, a, coming, you know, has- as, as, as you know, Tower what got me into the game, and I haven't had an opportunity to talk about Tower in a long time, and Justin's not here to razz me about it, but, <laughs> you know, I, I you have all these, these different sets that, in the lore... Are that they fight differently than everybody else, and they have different tactics, and they're known for different things. But you never saw that play out on the battlefield, and now we'll get to see that. And you know, just like Andrew was saying, you know, we're going to see things from Mordians. Which when was the last time we had unique special rules from Mordians? Uh, again, it's been again generations for some of this stuff where where we've been just kind of hungry for it, always knowing that. But it's also it's very difficult. It's time consuming to develop, and I think they finally nestled into. Um, I guess a pipeline where this is all possible, uh, and the, the the speed to market with some of this stuff is obviously accelerated, but in a good way uh, to to get us these types of things where it it may not have been possible, you know, a year ago, two years ago. I think one of the best things I saw out of that that post and that article is that we're going to see rules for individual units change a little. So that was one of my chief complaints of 8th edition was how everything just kind of felt a little, all the tactical squads felt the same as the Devastator squads, as the Assault squads, you know, other than this one of them can take two of this or one of that. But they've said, you know, they said in that article that that these units will be changed, not all of them, but, you know, some units will change and get more flavorful rules to rep to more accurately represent them on the battlefield. So what we've got with the index is this is the basic here, get your models on the table and play with your models. And when the codex comes out, we're going to get more thematic, more accurate representations of what these models do on the battlefield. So I'm super excited about that, that these, that these units are going to feel uh, a little more flavorful for, for what they're supposed to be. I'm I'm also profoundly confident in the same in the same vein of what Ricky was just talking about. I'm also profoundly confident that in the codexes they're going to fix the kind of point inefficiencies or point over efficacies, right? Like, uh, you know, I I had prior to Eighth Edition I had one Manticore built and painted, and then Eighth Edition broke and I painted two more. Uh, and the conversation that I've been having with my teammates for ATC and my other buddies are like, why why didn't you paint seven? Manticores are ridiculously point efficient. It's it's almost laughable. They're like in, like stupidly point efficient. And I said, well, because I think that the company is going to recognize this. And then when the Imperial Guard Codex comes out, the Manticore is going to become is going to get corrected. It's not going to be so wildly stupidly cheap and point efficient. Even if it and, goes up, you know, ten percent, twenty percent in points, uh, they have that ability to do so with the with the General's Handbook style approach they're going to do. Absolutely correct. And so I don't think it's worthwhile for me to just go out and be so reactive and be like, "Well, I need to paint, build, and paint seven Manticores." No, I'm okay with what I have now. And because I fully believe that they're so much more responsive to the eff- efficacy of particular models and, and to, to those models that are prone to being abused, 
that I don't think Manticores are going to be as good as they are for the next year. You have I to buy the heavy bolter, which is like the biggest sacrifice you have to make for for the Manticore. <laughs> it, it's 133 points. It's the most wildly efficient, durable 133 points money can buy in 8th edition. Yeah, it's laugh- well, and- It is laughable. It's at 2d6 of strength 10 shooting for d3 damage. It's laughable. It, it, you know, it's... It, it's ridiculous, and and ultimately, I'm like, they're going to fix it. There's no way it stays the way it is. It, it is balanced out. The mana core has never been high on the AP side. It's, but I'm a believer. I used to never go it's, anywhere it's without it's now. It's yeah. so. Good. You should never go anywhere without mana cores. Like travel with one. I I got a, I even got a couple of renegade mana cores painted up just just because, right? Uh, they're just so yeah. good. But they've never been awesome on the AP. They were only uh, AP four before. But that sometimes that high strength just does exactly what you need it to do. And, and, well, and I, I think that uh, the the broader point that Andrew is trying to bring up here is that uh, people with the game this young, there I think they're used to things being good for a long time. It, like they were in 7th edition. Eldar was good through all of 7th edition, right? So with how reactive that GW is going to be, to, to uh, Andrew's point, yeah. you guys really need to exercise some caution in your purchases <laughs> out there. Like it's on the true, show no here, it's true. No we, listen, we, we listen. are going to say, this is good. This is really good. I'm happy to have this. I did so well with XYZ. And, you know, as part of the show, we kind of worry like the things that we say influence people's uh, buying tendencies, even though we don't like necessarily endorse something. Be really careful, because if you drop three hundred dollars on something that next week isn't great, that's going to make you very sad. As a retailer, I need every one of you all to not listen to Chris Morgan at all right there. (laughs) you, You find a unit you like and you buy 10 of them. You go do it. Right now. Well, people are doing that, Ricky, man. There's a lot of stuff that's, uh, you know, email me out of stock on the Games Workshop site. And, I mean, there's – a there's I think they're – I know they will catch up to demand, but that shows just how much their demand is for units that people are changing around their army for. You're preaching to the choir, man. Like it's – every every week I have a customer asking for something that is out of stock. It is insane. Uh, But, man, like – you got to hand it to, to GW and their poor, poor uh, <laughs> those guys in the trenches who have who are dealing with the retailers because they, I mean it's it's every day they're taking orders and orders and orders and every day something's going out of stock and it's it's insane I couldn't even imagine what their warehouse is like right now with this eighth edition. <laughs> I was super frustrated. I mean, I was trying to buy I was trying to buy sixty million of bases, not a model. Not a unit, just bases. And they were like, oh, sorry, sold out. My bad, dog. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, so I've been scrounging around trying to find 60 mil bases for the last week and a half. Yeah, it's the um, most random stuff, Come too. back next week. After the ATC, all that stuff will be there. It's like, how am, I supposed to, how am I supposed to base these 18 mortar squads? I don't understand without y'all's help. So yeah. anyway. It was, it was I've ne- I never thought I'd say, I mean, you, you never would have saw it in 7th edition. Start collecting orcs. Been sold out for, for weeks. Uh, every, everybody bought, start collecting orcs, boxes of them, and uh, I still can't stock it. I'm trying to get them. Well, I love that's, it. That's I love it. Good. You want to talk about a new trend that's also uh, developing is the Castellan robots. Uh, I've, I've heard some chatter. Seeing those start to be something to develop into a real thing. Uh, now, I'm not no. saying create a run. I don't know if they're still available at Games Workshop right now or not. I'm just saying that I've seen people put a, start to put a lot of them on the table uh, because they've got good guns. Uh, toughness 7 with 6 wounds. Now, I know we talk about the, the math a lot, uh, but that Toughness 7, like a last cannon, doesn't wound it on 2s. It's wounded yeah, than things on threes. That's true, but this the last cannon doesn't wound tough five on twos either, right? Yeah. Like so, you know, there's there's those pros and cons. So T seven to me represents the weakest toughness value. I, I'm and by only that pointing I mean, it out because you know three weeks ago it would have it would have uh, right, wounded yes. that on a two. Now it doesn't. But go go ahead and make your point though because it's a good one. Well, I was just gonna say that. So across the board. You look at the toughness values of particular models, and T7 is the least point efficient toughness value. And by that, I mean you're paying a premium for a higher toughness. But at the end of the day, strength four and strength six affects you equally, right? Um, and so, and because of that, 
T7 becomes and there are very and there are and, and really what the, the important part of this is there are precious few T6 or strength six strength seven guns pardon my language there are very very few strength seven guns um, conversely toughness six is a much like more point efficient toughness value or, or T5 because the vast majority of weapons are strength four and they're going to affect you the exact same way. That it, as if you were tough seven. And ultimately, I'm sorry to, to, to segue, but to that's not point, even that's right in the point. That's that's very something I want to make or that we need to kind of enforce to people because the math of a D6 is any change one pip or the other is a pretty big percentage change when you're yeah. trying to figure out what you what the best thing to do is exactly. Well, and, and think about all of the the super prevalent strength six shooting that existed in the last edition. All of that, all of the points that you're paying for those strength six weapons are not gaining you the same benefit that they did before. Being close, really. We're looking at we're looking at you scatter laser squads. <laughs> and what, what really what really happened was that it made strength 4 so much more efficient. I mean, it, you look at I mean, again, I'm living right now I'm I'm so just deep in the the Imperial Guard world, but you look at the proliferation of strength 4 shooting. Um and and Marines are the same way to to a certain extent, but just, you know, I'm I'm looking at so um Wave Serpent Spam, for example, is going to be a, a big net list. I think it's going to be proliferated. You're going to see a lot of Wave Serpent Spam at uh, ATC, for example. It's a great tank again. I mean, it's back. It's a great tank. It's back. Yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. I think War Walkers um, are still good, too. Uh, I only need fives to wound you with a mortar, right? Because <laughs> it's strength four. Uh, with the, whether it's a bolter or a mortar or anything else like that, I only, I only need fives. And that is a really important thing it doesn't matter that you're tough seven because my bolter still is going to wound you 33 percent of the time whereas previously if i had a strength four gun on t7 now we're talking about 17 percent. and as to paul's point in a d6 game you're talking about huge cataclysmic point drop-offs every single time you change one of the pips yeah, and firing last cannons, it's it toughness five things. You know, you just you, it was so comfortable. You knew that you were going to wound on a two plus. Yeah, that's, that's not the world we live in anymore. Um, right. and, but but that is part. You know, to, to to not go too far, to kind of bring us back. The the toughness seven three plus armor save with the six wounds uh, is one of the benefits of these Castellan robots um, because they do stand up to the things that can do six wounds in one shot a lot better than they did before. That makes sense. So it's, yeah, it it does make perfect sense, and the robots are very fascinating too because, I mean, I think a squad of three of them is what fifty four shots or some fifty. It's an unbelievable amount of shots. I think it was one million. I, yeah, I did yes. the math. It, it's Check like it's out. like it's like a Doctor Evil sketch from Austin Powers. It's like <laughs> one billion one million shots. shots. <laughs> it's an unbelievable amount of shooting. You you basically have to engage them in assault on turn one or turn two. Otherwise, it's just. You know, you're you're done. You're done. Um, <laughs> Just want some robots with some freaking laser, laser beams. beams. That's what they've with, got, you know. And then you put call in there, and, and this guy lets you re-roll a lot, basically yeah, until that, you get tired of re-rolling. That's what they needed. <laughs> well, he has the Lord of Mars. Uh, call says you can re-roll any hit rolls in the shooting phase for friendly Mars units within six. So uh, again, this kind of plays in back to our earlier conversation about the way. The codices are going to be released and how they're going to be now like subsect families of, of Martian like Forge Worlds that you can play in the same way that you can play chapter tactics. So even now, as we talk about how like call interplays with robots and you're maximizing your your shooting or whatever, you can count on the fact that some Martian homeworld, right? I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn, I don't think. I mean, they, they straight up said that like some Forge Worlds are going to have different rules than other Forge Worlds. Uh, sure, and that's very, yeah. that's something very something to get excited about, right? Because, yeah, Call is awesome right now, and he can do so much more in six, eight months. I think you're probably dead on with that. And But he is. He's one of those kind of characters that, I, that they've kind of built him up. I don't mind if he does cool stuff. And I think it's neat that these legendary characters can buff units around them. Uh, and from a, from a competi- competitive side, it's even better when he's like really creates some over-the-top, over-the-top situations. And when you're talking about, you know, 50,000 shots with decent strength, you know, five, six strength shooting, wounding things pretty regularly, they get some rerolls. That, that's a, that's a unit to watch. Uh, this this unit is I mean, they're like eighty points a model or whatever, maybe a little bit more. But there's a lot packed into those points. 
I just like the I just like the idea of them being out there, not not in like a Death Star unit, you know, or the the Super Friends where it's all just gaggled up in this one thing. I like that we have these big epic heroes that are now going to be moving about the battlefield amongst their troops, you know, and it's not they're not just helping that unit because they're there. All the units around them are are better at their job. It's you know it's cinematic, you know, it's I, just, I, it's I, exciting. I do think it's important, though, if you look at, like, for example, the uh, the Dark Angels phalanx, right? And by that, I mean you've got Asriel, the Primaris Lieutenant, six Razorbacks, and four Venerable Dreadnoughts. Well, you took some special characters, and you basically took them from being where they could benefit one unit to now they can benefit a ton of units. And you've created a, a Death Star of its own variety. And again, I think that... It's a Death game, Blossom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no. I, think, I, I do GPM think Games approved. Workshop... approved. <laughs> I think... Uh, I do think that Games Workshop will figure it out and correct it. I don't, but in the see, I don't think that's a correction thing. I believe that some of these characters are meant to be the inspirational leaders, the, the linchpin, the, the focus of an army, the, the bulwark in which their opponents will, will crash and fail uh, because of their, their leadership capabilities from a, from a theme-wise. And I think that's represented uh, with the way they're doing it. Yeah. I, oh, I think I mean, the bigger issue is, should they affect tanks? You know, do you really inspire a tank? You know, I mean... Yes. <laughs> now, now, listen, now listen, Ricky. Okay, if, if playing D&D &D taught me anything, and having a warlord in the party taught me anything... Is that if you yell at someone hard enough, their wounds will get better. <laughs> That's so, a lot of to go off of. So uh, I, I'm going to go for yes, tanks can be inspired. Right, fair enough. I love that Azrael is good. I love that Azrael is, is bringing something to the table again, and that he will be on on the table. Please, GW, give him a new model. I'm I'm happy that he's there. Um, I I wish there was something to discourage that castle up in the center, surround Gilliman, Azrael, whatever Drago, whoever whoever your guy in charge is, surround him with Razorbacks and Dreadnoughts, and just stand there and shoot. But it's, that's that's the way things are now. So as the game matures, that we'll see different. And maybe maybe you don't. I, I don't know. But that may always be something that's it may be an eternal thing in this game. But I think that the, as the game matures and the codexes start to get released and tactics evolve. Evolve and you know that that's going to change. Let, let me let me jump and because I want to talk about the kind of big things that that I'm seeing develop uh, that people are starting to play and demon princes are going to be a problem. Elaborate oh, yeah. the demon prince with wings and then if you take uh, the malefic talons. So this is where they're kind of throwing us a curveball here because most people arm themselves with a with a sword or an axe uh, and some wings. And oh, you want to take the talons. talons. Yeah. But the yeah. talons, just the two claws, are very inexpensive. So for 180 points, you get a demon prince that when you give it a mark, which you just get to choose the mark, uh, if you, you can make it a psyker if you give it Zinch, Nurgle, or Slanesh, and you're a strength 7, toughness 6, Eight wounds with four attacks. Uh, the Malefic Talons give you a strength to user, but they're damage two. So all right. those attacks are converting uh, for lots of damage. And each, and the, it goes even better than that. Each time the model fights, it makes one additional attack with this weapon. A model arm with two Ooh. sets of Malefic Talons can make three additional three attacks. attacks yep. So you're swinging with seven attacks, neg two AP, two wounds apiece on a flying creature, Psyker, for 180 points. It is one of the best bargains in the game right now, if you ask me. But if you're corn and you take the corn mark, you trade being a psyker for one extra attack. Yeah, I don't see anybody wanting to do that. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't you're right. Unless you're, correct, you're, though. unless you're, you know, you want to be corn because, I mean, you're giving up being able to shoot smite around the table because they are only one, uh, what, what is it called, mastery level anymore? It they, they know one psychic, one psychic power each friendly right. psychic phase and attempt to deny one psychic power each uh, enemy psychic phase. It knows the smite power and one psychic power from the dark hereticus discipline. And yep. one, uh, your, your, uh, when you get the wings, uh, your move characteristic does increase to 12. So there's that. But let me tell you about this psychic power called warp time. This thing is, is that good. That's Rocky Horror Picture Show. It is, yeah, by RKO. This is it. 
Warp time has a warp charge value of six. So, you know, not guaranteed to get it off, I don't guess. More more often than not, you are going to. Um, if manifested, pick a friendly heretic Astartes unit within three inches of the Psyker. That unit can immediately move as if it were its movement phase. You cannot use warp time on a unit more than once each psychic phase. So let's just say you're a demon prince that happens to also be a heretic Astartes. You know you're going to be within three inches of yourself because that's a clarification of the rules. You move 12. You can move again, 24, and then you're in charge range, an easy charge range in a lot of games. Yeah, and plus you have the ability to throw out a bunch of smites and, and things like that and getting getting yourself in the position to put those where they're going to hurt the most. Yeah, low-key, my demon player on my ATC team has five of these characters in his army. I, like, I don't so, know why you wouldn't. It's 180 yeah. points. It, it's very It's very obvious. If you're trying to win games with demons, you take many of these characters. They're very <laughs> good. They're easy to buff. The psychic powers are kind of foolproof. It's like you either warp time or smite kind of kind of interchangeably. And that's not a tough decision point either. You're like, well, this is very obvious. The closest unit to me is a high target priority. Well, then I'll smite. Or I can pull off an assault if I warp time. Okay, then I'll warp time. It's not really a super difficult decision point uh, for either of those rules. So um, uh, definitely, 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 definitely a kind of one of those auto include foolproof the thing with uh the lord of being a lord a prince of chaos you can re-roll hit rolls of one made for friendly legion units within six inches of the model which you're re-rolling you know you again you're within the distance of yourself and the thing hits on twos so it's going to convert many many wounds with this this thing is almost foolproof they're just they're one of those things that's like inherently 40k you know like you, you just the model yeah. just looks 40k if you ask me it's, it's it's not 40k. I, I still remember prince. the first time I fought a demon prince on the table. My first third edition event, you know, the Eye of Terror campaign. The second game I played was against a, a demon prince. And I was like, what is this? And why is he doing that to me? <laughs> well, over the years, they've, they've had, you know, kind of a, sometimes they were really great. Then they were not. I mean, but they follow the, the life cycle of models over, over the editions. But I think they're back. I mean, you can't go wrong with that that point efficiency, I don't think. It it pretty much does everything that you would want it to do. Well, you can't I, really argue with it. No. You know, it's interesting. I I was talking to, again, my demon player. We're in preparation for ATC, and we're kind of like you know, discussing potential matchups and what does he want to avoid and what, what, what does a guy with a bunch of demon princes – what is he hoping for? What does he want to avoid? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All those kind of considerations that you go into with ATC. And ultimately, what we found was that there are a ton fewer things he wants to avoid than there are things he's readily anticipating and wanting to play with. Like, he's like, yeah, bring on knights. Let's do this. Um, yeah, bring on um, the, the, the the dark angels or, or rowboat um, phalanx kind of uh, death blossoms, death, death stars, um, which they, that's what they are. They are death stars. Um, They're a total Swiss army knife talking about the demons yeah 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 i think they're very capable of dealing with a ton of stuff that other armies are just very ill-equipped to deal with i we we talked at length and the only thing he was like the only thing i really want to avoid is is imperial guard or a tau gun line and i was like all right that's super easy to keep you away from <laughs> like cause yeah. nobody's gonna be playing tau and uh, with the atc pairing system very easy to keep you away from from imperial guard so um i think that demons will do well i think that the the demon prince especially the zinch demon prince smite spam lists are going to do exceptionally well at atc this year i just and, think and, you and, don't and have to GT's think you forward. hit the nail on the head earlier is that there's no you're not having to make these like critical decisions it just the the situation tells you what to do with these things yeah and I mean, that's how i feel about guard as i've now like played guard for i guess oh uh, over a dozen eighth edition games i'm like it's like kind of foolproof you just like press the red button and things disappear <laughs> you it's press not this button difficult. until all the models are gone on the other side exactly <laughs> but but i i fully anticipate uh um, expand nets boys yeah right exactly just assault them that's the guard is a very assaulty army um <laughs> I, just, I fully expect though to that for that not to i don't want to say the word fixed but for gw to recognize the shortcomings and the advantages and to, to kind of cost things out appropriately well I, th I think what they've done is they've got a mechanism now to address that 
Uh, and so, and the things that you think are overpowered in the areas, I mean, you can look at something and say that's efficient, but it might just be functioning as designed. And, and that's okay, right? But it, I think what the important thing to realize is that there is a mechanism in place to address the things that are not by design. Because I, I think that the, what, they've, what they've come to recognize on the, the designer side is that sometimes things just don't plan out. Like, you know, I, I've made this, this, uh, this kind of talk before. But I heard like a spoof, or I read a spoof article a long time ago about game designers. And the game developer went on this rant in the, in the fake article about how he's like, how did I know that you were going to jump out of the land speeder wearing your orange pants and try to pick a flower, uh, while sending a direct message to someone who was offline? You know, like this weird collection of things in this multifaceted game that all happened right then. It's, it's almost impossible for a developer to account for that or even be expected to account for that. And there wasn't a mechanism. Like if you go back and listen to the, the interview I did with Robin Crudis, he's very explicit about this, very open about this. He said, they just didn't have a path uh, to make whatever tweak or change. I won't even say correction, just, just tweak. They didn't have a way to do that. And now they do. And it's built into the system and it's beautiful. Yeah. I I think that that makes perfect sense. And I think that the way that we talked about this, I guess, two weeks ago or so about the way the codex, the, the, the in, index is laid out and how I anticipate the codex is being laid out. Um, it allows for quick revisions, quick changes and for for point corrections that are very necessary. And that's good. I love it. I, I want to hear everyone's uh, like boogeyman units. If you've been being playing, if you're out there, hit us up on Facebook or, or hit me up on Twitter or any, any of these other guys too uh, on Facebook about what the boogeyman unit that you're seeing out there. You know, what are the crazy things that people are putting together? Because we're, you know, we're brewing. We're in the lab. We're getting ready for this big old tournament. But I know we haven't thought of everything. So I, I've got something that I didn't see coming that I played this weekend. Bjorn the Fell Handed. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I'm I'm totally on board with this. Go ahead, Adam. Let's I'm hear it. Very excited about this. Okay. First of all, we we know dreadnoughts are good. We can accept the fact that dreadnoughts are are good in this edition. He's a dreadnought that has, I believe, he has an invul save. I might be wrong there, but just like any other color in the box, fill in the blank dreadnought, where you can put on whatever war gear you want, he can too. You can give him a shield. You can give him a las cannon. That's all well and good. He's a character. And from what I understand, he's the only Dreadnought character in the game anymore. Caster's gone, right? Uh, the there, there's a, there's Dread? Caster there's doesn't a have a Forge world. Yeah, yeah there's Caster a couple of Forge World ones, but... Yeah, yeah, okay. So in the ATC talk, because my, my head's wrapped around that, right. he's the only character Dreadnought that I can think of. So he can't be targeted unless he's closest. He, if you put him with a las cannon, he's got range on you. He can isn't, hide behind stuff. Isn't he eleven wounds though? He's eight wounds. He's only <laughs> eight okay, wounds. so he legit can't be targeted. Yeah, wow, that's why. But he has like a six or twelve inch bubble that allows everything around him to to reroll hits. All right, let me let me read it here. So. All right, first off, he's got, and they should have no fear, of course. Uh, Ancient Tactician, if your army is battleforged, you receive one additional ca- command point if it includes Bjorn. Uh, last of the Company of Rust, you can reroll hit rolls of one for friendly Space Wolves units that are within six inches of him. Then he's got Legendary Tenacity, roll a d6 each time he would lose a wound, and on a five plus, that wound is not lost. That's right. fantastic. That's what makes him pretty bonkers. Oh, and best of all, smoke launchers. <laughs> Just yeah, kidding. He's, he's not the only dreadnought character in normal 40k. The the librarian dreadnoughts are also characters, right? Oh, they gosh. are, but they, they don't they don't give off the they don't operate. You're absolutely right. They can't be. They don't. They don't like spread the buffs like this. And, and I don't exactly. believe they can take the shield either. I, I believe he can take all the shooting weapons. He replaces assault cannons with the Hellfrost cannon, heavy plasma cannon, or twin last cannon. Correct. What, what I didn't expect was somebody parking a T7 or T8 unit in the backfield, surrounded by assault cannons and devastators, rerolling ones to hit because they're close enough, and I can't target them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you don't you don't plan on that. Now. Yeah, and I'm not saying that he's he's the best thing in the world. Just very unexpected, sneaky good. I'll take that. That's one of the things. That's what we're talking about here is things that uh you know to, get, to kind of prep people for what they could see. And I think that the uh, being able to dreadnoughts, you know, again, you mentioned that they're good and they are good, but the space wolves can take a bunch of them also. And things like murder fang and. Uh, I mean, if if that guy's still still around, but their dreadnoughts uh, being able to take some close combat abilities are pretty strong. Yeah, and yeah. just the fact that you can have 
dreadnoughts that are not going to get sniped out before they get into close combat i think is is fantastic you can you can set those dreadnoughts up and get them into combat where they want to be you know not, uh that that's cool that that he's not he's going to be at full health by the time he gets there and he's going to be able to do work when he gets in there. And Murder Fang think- does exist. He's also a character with eight wounds. Uh, and you can – his the, the murder claws, uh, you can uh, so much murder wound rolls with this weapon. And he, also, so, and he has murder lust. You can re-roll any failed charges with Murder Fang. I definitely want to agree that I think Bjorn, when I first read him, was like, this guy's going to get played a lot. And he should. He's very, very good. And I think part of it is that – is the indiction – is – the one of the things that I think that dreadnoughts enable a player to do is they present a tremendous amount of backfield shooting. But what Bjorn and I think what a lot of balanced players are going to bring, what I think that will come to fruition as kind of the top, one of the most one of the more top end options, is going to be the fact that close combat weapon dreadnoughts are incredible counter assault units. Oh yeah. And so Bjorn is a great example. The librarian dreadnought phenomenal example is if you put a twin las cannon and a dreadnought close combat weapon on something, that's a unit that is, is just, it, it's a perfect dual purpose model because you can't just ignore it. You can't just let two BS four las cannons rain down on you. But you can't also assault it because that Dreadnought Close Combat will, weapon will turn you into glue. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. I think Dreadnoughts have kind of – and not in the abusive way. I mean I think that my ATC list last year was kind of that hallmark of how you can really make Dreadnoughts good in 7th edition. But in 8th, they're just naturally good. You don't have to – there's no spamming them. You no gimmicks. Put, yeah, there's just... no gimmicks. It's just like you just put two of them in your list and they add things. They're like a legitimate like, wow, I have 170 points to spend. Let me take these dreadnoughts. They're awesome. Uh, and that's really, really cool. I really enjoy that. Man, that's awesome. We're going to go and wrap this up right here. I know it's going to be a little bit longer of a show. Uh, but, you know, again, this is just stuff as we, we come about with 8th edition and want to talk about the cool things and maybe some yeah, – I want to hear what other folks have added to their list or what they played against that kind of seemed, you know, it uh, it either either beat them up or could have done better or whatever. Anyway, you guys got anything to add before we get out of here? No, nope. nope. I'm just uh, – I'm stoked to have my own smaller event this weekend that I'm that I'm running and hopefully we'll have some – some additional commentary on what uh, what people are bringing this competitive. We are allowing Forge World at my at my GT this weekend, so let's. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how things are shaping up. It's a sold out event, but uh, please post some pictures up on the FTN Facebook. Will do. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun party. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night, everybody. Why is the rum gone?